Good evening, everybody, and welcome along to this edition of Lear Confidential on LearMedia.tv and our usual email, info at LearMedia.tv. We're delighted to welcome again. It's been, I was looking back, Councillor Connor Sheehan from the Labour Party. Welcome, Connor, to the show. Thanks very much, Pat, and thanks very much for having me on. Oh, I was looking at the date. It's last September since we were talking. Yeah. Would you credit, it's only when you look back at the dates, I was saying, the time that goes by so quickly. Yeah, it's true. It's just with, I suppose, with COVID and with lockdowns. And I feel like I've measured the last two years in terms of lockdowns, you know, as opposed yes. to in terms of actually um, time that's passed, if you understand where I'm coming from. Absolutely. And uh, if you get a knock on the window, I won't mind. You can say hello to people while we <laughs> But anyway, Connor. Just bef- uh, the reason I've been is for a number of points. Uh, you you had you you had an article recently in the local, I think, the Limerick Leader or the Limerick Post, maybe both of them here in Limerick, about the fact that houses, if they are available, if you have a deposit, if you're approved for a mortgage, if, if all those ifs become yeses, you still find yourself in a position whereby you cannot buy a house, you cannot get a house, because uh, well, obviously there aren't enough of them there. And over the last 10, 15 years, we know that not enough houses have been built. So where does that leave people? I mean, you're in your 30s, I presume, or something like that, are you? Very late 20s. Late 20s. Aha, uh-huh. sorry about that. But I mean, even people uh, back 40, 50 years ago could aspire to at least saving up and buying a house. I don't years. think that's the, the case anymore. Well, I suppose, I suppose I better start off by outlining my own situation. So basically, before the end of 2018, um, I moved back home with my parents um, because I'd moved back down from Dublin. I was renting for a period. Um, yeah. Rents were going up. Um, my income wasn't going up to match it. So I said, you know what? Um, I have enough now, effectively, spending what I would have considered dead money on rent. So I said, I moved back in with mom and dad for, you know, two years or whatever, save the money for a deposit and hopefully be in a position to buy a house. So I moved back in with my parents. I saved and saved and saved. So in some months, I saved more than half my income. Uh, And in January of this year, I went for mortgage approval. I had the deposit together and I thought, yippee, um, I'm sorted. Or so I thought. But you yeah. see what happened was I got the mortgage approval and that was grand. Um, I have and been... Do you have to give details uh, when you go into the institution to get a mortgage? Do you have to give details of the potential property or properties? Do you have to give a list of what... How no. Does it... no, but you have to show your ability to pay. So you basically, if you have any loans or anything like that, they have to be cleared. Yeah. Um, you have to as well show that the money that you are saving every month, you have to have a regular pattern of saving, which yeah. counts towards your ability to pay. So you have to be able to pay the mortgage. And you're able to borrow three and a half times your salary and you have to give pay slips um, for six months. You need letters for you, from your employer. Um, there's an awful lot of forms and paperwork um, to be filled out and it's quite an arduous process and the mortgage approval lasts for six months and it can be then renewed. But you see, the thing is, like, the thing with the mortgage is that um, basically the central bank could change the rules um, which could affect your ability to renew it because that's one of the things that's being talked about at the moment because there are a lot of people with mortgage approval at the moment but there aren't an all, there aren't a lot of houses so one yeah. of the things they're talking about is that the central bank might tighten the len- the lending rules which is worrying enough right and then of course uh, after getting approval and all of that there's an awful lot of this disquieting um, I say this is not um, a, a scientific, uh, there's no science to back this up, but there's word of mouth, and I've been talking to a number of people where this famous gazumping, this crack is still going on a lot. As in, in terms like, of. Like when you go and uh, put a bid on a house for 400 grand, 
uh, there's someone come back to you, well, it's gone up to 440. Well, to be honest, the zumping is an interesting phrase and um, with your permission, I might actually steal it. Um, I've been gazumped, I'd say, about nine times. Yeah, um, yeah. Because what happens, Pat, is you have a house. Yeah. And like the houses that I've looked at, um, you know, they've been just bog standard sort of houses. So either a three bedroom semi or a terraced house, you know, maybe anywhere between 20 and 40 years old in varying condition. Yeah. Yeah. And I've been outbid at least um, eight or nine times because what happens is you end up with a house, you have four or five people interested in the house and it ends up between you go up five, they go up 10, and then eventually you reach, you know, your cutoff point. I reach a, p- a sum of money where I say, no, I'm out. I can't, I can't go above that. Um, and that's happened to me an awful lot um, because houses now are going for on average 20 and 30,000 euro above the asking price. In fact, house prices in Limerick have gone up. Um, yeah. 10% since January alone of this year. Probably probably higher. That's an average, probably, depending on the thing. But you know, Connor, I don't know what the solution is. There's uh, every seven or eight or ten months, there seems to be a new minister for housing, and they come up with another plan, and they launch it in a blaze of fanfare of glory, no matter who they are. And then it's all forgotten about, and they, they go on uh, all the main news stations talking about it, and it's the flavour of the one for two or three weeks in the media and it's gone again. But there's physically very little houses, very few houses. I live out in Shannon and um, Shannon Town, County Clare. There's a few houses gone up, going up there now in a few apartments, but really nothing, nothing to soothe. Even my own son is renting, nothing to soothe. If he wants to buy, he probably have to go to Donegal by the look of it, even though he's living in Shannon. But the point I'm making is this. Why can't the political parties get together in the national interest and say, build, put in a huge amount of money, which we did when we had no money in the 50s and 60s and 70s, and build huge blocks of houses that are still standing today. Why well, can't it be done? There's a couple of things, Pat, right? You're right when you say every time there's a new Minister for Housing, there's a new plan and it's launched to much fanfare and the Minister goes touring the media and so on and it's all, it's all honey and roses. But the fact of the matter is, the devil is in the delivery, right? Yes. Yes. The devil is in the delivery because I've gone through housing plans belonging to previous Ministers in my council work just to see. i give you an example. There was a plan launched by Alan Kelly in 2016 um, before he left office, I went through it. There was only a third of what was actually in that plan was built. I estimate roughly a third. because so I went through local authority by local authority. Um, the, for, for starters, when it comes to social and affordable housing, the um, department's four or five stage approval process is too complicated. Like if you're a local authority and you nearly want to put up a few TP sheds you have to go and go through this really long um, process whereby you're going back and forth with the department at stage one, stage two, stage three. That all needs to be copied. I thought, I thought the department had given autonomy to the to the local councils, the county councils or whatever they are, to do, to build their own houses. Only have- if it's below €8 million. Euro. Um which in housing terms is that's a pigeony sum of money, you know. Well, if the 38 local authorities built 8 million euros worth of houses without going through planning permission to be a start. Well, it's not even that they have to go through planning permission. They have to go through planning permission, but they don't have to go through the... They don't have to go to the Department of Housing, you know, every yeah. time I want yes. to, you know... Yeah. Make I, I, I think that's a criticism, I suppose, Conor, we could level at them, no matter who they are, is the centralisation of this. Yeah. Now, it's all very fine to having having centralisation, but if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. You know? If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Now, the councils yourself that you're sitting on, you're not long, do you? You came in at the last election. Yeah, yeah. But like myself, you've always had a passing interest in politics anyway. But then there's the, there's the second or third strand to this criticism 
I know we're criticising, but this is all justified because there's no houses there. And particularly for single people like myself, you might as well forget about it. You might as well buy one of those sheds and ask someone to put up in your backyard and you can sleep and instead of sleeping in a tent. But that's what it's coming to. A lot of single people in this republic anyway, and today, which is yeah. 2021. But when I'm in the same boat myself, yeah, you know. Right. And they're, they're, and they're, and they're fine big cars. That's your own car. You couldn't really sleep in the back seat of that, and it's really comfortable enough. This, yeah, this is but this is my own car. You see, I can fold the seats flat. And then fill it with election posters. Airbnb, um, Airbnb of Connor Ring. <laughs> yeah, but, but anyway, there's no, um, there are empty houses in Limerick. Yeah. Like, in a, and there are empty houses in Shannon Town. And they're empty for years. Yeah. Years and years. And they, and they shouldn't be. Now, the council itself, you're sitting on it. So I think there should be every single council meeting. This should be on the agenda. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree. I, I agree with this completely with the sentiment of what you're saying because we requested a special meeting on. They're known as voids. Um, that that's what they're known as within the council, and like the amount of voids in Limerick, like it's a disgrace. You know, yeah. you drive up um. Any road, you know, you drive up Hyde Road, you see four or five boarded up houses and you're wondering, like, why are they boarded up when, say, for example, the tenant who had them previously might be dead five or six years? Like, it's not acceptable, yeah. you know? Oh. The, the length of time we had Mountain Mount Shannon Town. Do yeah, know? they're Does, everywhere. Does anybody really care? Well, I, I, I think plenty of people care, but I think... There's so much, like, even when it comes to refitting voids, there's so much bureaucracy at local government level that, like, you get tangled up in it like spaghetti, trying to get things done. Like, to refit a void, it takes 33 weeks. Why? Because they have to apply for the funding, first of all, from the void scheme, from the department. Then they have to go to tender. Then well, they have to get isn't every council given a budget at the start of the year? Yeah, but and and then that that budget covers all those things. No, but the budget for voids or vacant houses that comes from the void scheme from the Department of Housing, so that comes directly from that exchequer funding. The but the budget that we have covers. That's the money that we generate and spend ourselves. Um, and that and that wouldn't be accounted for. Um, that would be off balance sheet, you know. Connor, uh, I know we're jumping around the place. Could you do me a favour? This is only a personal thing of mine. Could you ask the council to stop building those appalling timber shambles around the town here? They are shocking. Which the um the 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 build outs. The things out in the footpath that stay up the footpath so the drunks can get drunk on them every night of the week. It's appalling. I I'll, take, I'll take that. I'll um I haven't witnessed any drunks in them yet myself now, but yeah, um the weather is inclement. But, but they were confidential as well come on me. I'd like to have Council Connor Sheen with us. But the housing I think Connor on a more serious note, I mean I don't know really. I don't know my son's uh, well I have a son living in Berlin and a son in Shannon. My, I have a daughter and Dundalk who happen to have their own houses and their husband, which is good, but really and truly, the generation of your age and slightly older must be, I mean, at the, that's bad enough not being able to buy your house, not being able to have the choice to rent, but renting, then you have no other choice on your rent, which is another scandal again. Yeah, and it's, it's just... Two. I think the uh, the ESRI did a survey recently and they found out that like we my generation and slightly older we're the first generation we actually have worse outcomes than our parents yeah. and I won't believe that because my parents bought their first house at 24 on two reasonably modest incomes mm -hmm. um, and it was a very fairly new house at the time um I haven't got a hope. I mean, a lot of the places that I've been looking at and am looking at, Pat, require an 
awful lot of work, you know. A really, really, and really, really big work, you know. But I'm, I'm, you'll, never, you'll never do that, Connor. You'll never rise up to that. Sure. I mean, if there was a, a continental style renting with security of tenure with long leases for 25 or 30 years, that would be something. There wouldn't be so much money, but it's shocking. I feel if all of Fine Gael and the, the Green Party now were in power, they had no interest in housing. Well, I even I don't even think that it's they've no interest in housing. I think they've been captured by lobbyists. So these lobbyists come into the department and the lobbyists tell them this is what you need to do. Like I'll give you an example. If you look at the help to buy scheme, if you look at shared equity, these schemes are all inflationary measures and they'll only drive house prices up. They're designed by lobbyists. Yeah, no, you know? no. No, no, they have proved no good at all. None. I think people should... I think we have a, a horrific apartheid system of housing in this state in 2021. There's no other way of describing it. You should build houses for our citizens. If you can buy the one, if you can buy number one, wherever it is, you buy it, Connor. If I can rent to buy number two, I rent to buy it. Build houses like they do in every other country in Europe. And if you can buy them, you can buy them. If you can rent them, give them security of tenure for their 25 years, really whatever you want to give them, which I think is the only way to go. I don't know. I'd be throwing my head up under the times, you know. Now, the latest opinion polls, I'm sure you've been looking at them as Labour Party. There's a by-election coming up in uh, Dublin Bay South. And you've got the, the I suppose, the... Ivana Batchik, she's well known anyway as a candidate in the Dublin Bay South. I'm saying, how do you think, how do you rate her chances? Is she any chance? Well, the first thing I'd say, Pat, is that, look, the opinion polls are where they are um, and they're where they were for the last year or so. And it's obvious from the opinion polls that as a party, um, we have our work cut out in front of us, particularly in terms of regaining um, trust being the key word because there was an awful lot of trust lost when we were in government. And there was decisions that were made uh, that were frankly wrong um, and shouldn't have been made. And we need to prove to people that, you know, we have we have atoned for our mistakes. Um, and look, I, I, I'm not going to gloss over it or lie or, you know, or start, you know. No, I mean, I think that's history you now. This is, I think, the party itself. But, uh, it's not to ignore the past. You can't ignore the past. It's no, but, but yeah, and I think you need to move on. I think in terms of Ivana, I think if you were talking about candidates and if you were to take political parties out of it, I think she's the strongest individual candidate given her record, given the fact that she's published more legislation than any other senator in her time in the Senate, given yeah. her long time activism with civil liberties and different things things like that um, and, and progressive causes but I suppose like look we have a battle on our hands but at the same time you know I personally and I know Ivana as well like we're not ones to shy away from a fight um, we'll certainly give it our best shot um the fact of the matter is, there's, as far as I'm concerned, there's only three outcomes to this by-election. Either Fine Gael will win it, Sinn Féin will win it, or there's a possibility Ivana might win it. Outside of that, I, I, I think those are the three possible options. And I think who wins what will depend on who comes where in the first count or so. Like, I went up and did a bit of canvassing last week. Um, yeah. I was getting a lot of blowback from traditional Fine Gael voters who said they were voting for Ivana um, off the back that women voters in particular who were disappointed that um, Kate O'Connell, the former TD, was well, yeah, I think Yeah, you're right there. I think Fine Gael are after, I won't say it's after shooting themselves in the foot, but I, I thought that she was just going to be rubber stamped. And I don't mean that in any uh, way that, that uh, anyone has a right, divine right, but I'm just saying... She was well known. She was a name, as they say. Uh, you didn't have to go around and introduce her to anybody. Everybody knew who she was. Everybody who knew who she stood for. But we know 
that uh, the leader of Fine Gael didn't want, and that was the end of it. Yeah, exactly. Well, I, I, I think she sort of, I, I think particular Pat, she did an interview on RT Radio 1's Brendan O'Connor programme. You might remember this in March. I, I, went, I went back and listened to it, yeah. Yeah, and I thought that was when she ultimately more or less marked her card. She said something along the lines of, well, what did Leo Varadkar ever actually do for Fine Gael? And she yeah. was talking about lost votes and lost seats. And I think, and the, the one thing I know from being involved in politics is that politicians, no matter how much they tell you, are incredibly thin-skinned, you know? Oh, they are. Oh, they are. They're particularly, I mean, well, Fine Gael, if Fine Gael think the tide is going to go out with Brad Karani and the other leader, they're gone. Oh, yeah. They're and, gone. I, and I think if Farad Kar loses the by-election, I think um, uh, the I main... I've seen, seen a fall any chance there now in Dublin. Well, you, you were up canvassing, were you? Yeah. I mean, Lynn Boylan for Sinn Féin is well known anyway. Yeah, she is. She doesn't have to be introduced in the same way as Ivana Bacek. I think it's between the two of them. That's my own opinion because they're well known. Because traditionally by-elections aren't won by the parties in power. I know anything can change, but particularly now, I think their handling lately of the COVID situation has been appalling, abysmal. I mean, this whole controversy about antigen testing, Connor. Yeah. Hit the lines. How come every other country and airport in Europe sees fit to use it and we don't? Well, I think, do you know the way I said when... You know the way I said a few minutes ago that I thought in re relation to housing that the government were captured by lobbyists? I think in relation to health, because of what happened after Christmas, the government have been captured by Neffet and Tony Holohan. You know? Yeah, and should, oh, yeah you're right. The government should govern. Those people are put out in front and centre, which is an insult to the citizens of this republic and to our democratically elected people in Dali to put them out front and centre as if they are running the country is shocking. Yeah. It's shocking. I mean, it's the ministers, that, the frontline ministers, so to speak, for, for using that awful word, frontline ministers, like the Minister for Health, the Taunish, the Taoiseach, should be out front. The same as here when they have this, the the conference in Britain, you have the Prime Minister there, you know, and the Minister, whatever way you think about them, they're taking responsibility for these decisions. But I honestly think that they said that uh, we were flattening the curve for us the way back. Do you remember that? We're going to close on for three months to flatten the curve. The curve has never been flattened in a year and a half, as far as I know, Connor, you know? Yeah. I mean, it was a massive curve, and it's still there. And now they said uh, these this experimental vaccines that are approved by the WHO, and they are experimental vaccines, everybody should get them. But apparently, if you do, you still must wear a mask, you still must social distance, and you can't go out. Well, That's I, well, I, I'm, well, I think like, look, I mean, I certainly wouldn't like to get COVID. Um, I know. Um, so one of my friends got it and unfortunately she got long COVID after it and she's still not right. But like, look, I, I think we just need to drive on. Well, like any virus, there's, go, there's going to be a certain percentage of the population going to get it no matter what you do. It's yeah, like yeah, yeah, virus, you know? yeah, there is, but it's about, I think as well, trying to stop people getting seriously ill from it. I mean, I mean, personally, personally, like, I think we just need to just drive on with the vaccination, and then w once we have the once we have enough people in the country vaccinated, then we'll just have to, you know. I mean, once people have, I don't think you can get rid of COVID. So once people have, it's going to be as we know in virus, they're going to come and go. Yeah, and I think that once people have been vaccinated against, I think severe disease, like I mean. You know, I mean, you can see at the moment, like, the situation is much better than it was. There's only 19 people in ICU 
as opposed to 150 or whatever there was a couple of months ago. So it's not, um, I think the vaccination is working, you know. Um, well, I don't know, sure. I mean, if it is working, why are all the businesses open and get on with life? And if you don't want to go, don't go out. But I, I, I think they are. I think they're they're certainly start. Most of them are have reopened by now, you know. And I mean, there's been no real spike since no. everything reopened. So I, I, I think the vaccines are working. I mean, the amount of people over, say, the age of fifty now that are seriously ill with COVID, it's gone way, way down compared to what it was. That's a, that's a, there's a lot of positives. I mean, I'm just putting on things. There's a lot of positives. There's no doubt about that. And, but, and personally, yeah, I feel are being scared of saying, I met people every day, they say, I can't go on holidays, Pat, and I say, why? Because I didn't get vaccinated. I said, no, being vaccinated isn't a requirement for leaving the country, Freeman. There's nothing going to happen like that. There's no law against you moving around Europe, you know? Well, I mean, from the 19th of July, I think people can start if they want to go on holidays, um, and I mean, if somebody's been fully vaccinated, they're saying from the 19th of July, they don't need to get a negative PCR test before they go. They can just go. So that should give people peace of mind, you know. People can go to 11 countries at the moment with an antigen test 24 hours before you turn up at the airport. That's fine. Isn't but I definitely think we should be rolling out antigen testing as part of the roadmap for getting oh, sure, our yeah. travel back. Yeah. And that at the very least, we should be doing a pilot of it, you know. It's no, that's a no-brainer, really. One person shouldn't decide for the whole country whether it's wrong or right, you know? Yeah. And the chief medical officer has been really out of order and out of line in the last couple of weeks. I mean, he said, I drove into Dublin and saw crowds of people enjoying themselves. I mean, that was the headline on RT. Do you remember that? Yeah, I do, I do. What do you think of that? Um... Personally, I'd rather see people like I was one of the people that was calling for things like um, more bins and pop up public toilets, because I think if we're yes. going to encourage people yes. to have an outdoor summer, then we need to put facilities in place for them. And we need the facilities as well so that, you know, we don't have situations where people are urinating in public areas or w whatever. But look, I mean, you're, I mean, if you look at it, there hasn't been. um there hasn't been a massive increase in COVID cases in Dublin since the May, since the June bank holiday weekend. So look, I, I, I think that... Um, there's, been, there's been no spikes, aren't you? You're right, Connor. I mean, the fact... Also, yeah, maybe it might way, be before, we, before we leave, you're, um, you're going to come into some money. I don't mean you personally. I mean, there's, <laughs> there's a proposal gone through, I think, for all councillors to be put on uh, 25000 a year, I think, was it? Yeah, well, there, it's, it's about index linking a councillor's salary to a, grade in, to a level four grade in civil service. And I suppose one of the reasons that that's happening as well is because councillors' councillors' pay was cut from 19000 to 17000 during the recession. Um. And I suppose councillors, for the amount of work, like I could be in councillors' part-time job, and obviously I have another job, but to be honest, my council work takes up 60, 70% of my time. Um, I spend an awful lot of time late into the evening on my laptop, replying to emails, dealing with constituents, you know, so it, it really is something that takes up an awful lot of time. So like, you know, I think it's about time the councillors got a fair remuneration. I think councillors need more responsibility as well, because every time we try to reform local government in this country, we make things worse, you know? Yeah, and we were saying, Connor, before we came on here, that I think it's time. Uh, we have the weakest local government in... We are one yeah. of the weakest local governments in Europe, I think, at this stage. Yeah. Uh, that they don't have any... And that's not a criticism because there's some fine councils around the country, not because yeah, you're it's, being a, it's, a, it's a system that's broken. Exactly. I mean, you you know, you see, and you hear from people, your constituents, from people around you, you know what the problems are. We all do. And you hear the particular nuance of those problems, and you cannot do anything about it. Really, in one way, you can bring, you can bring attention to it. 
you can advocate on behalf of those people to the different officials, but then how do you get action? You know, how do you That's get exactly. action for those things? And also, God, you, were you familiar with Corabar House that was flattened over? I was, day? yeah. And we, we tried to get it put on the list of protected structures. I saw that. No. It's we gone now. Well, I suppose there comes a time when when it's not derelict anymore, when it's not alone derelict, but it's dangerously derelict. And uh, I mean, and really, I don't know who, who owned it in the end, do you know? I'm not, I think that some developer owns it now because it's they, they are developing it into apartments or something. Right, okay. Well, there you go, you might be able to buy one of them, you know? Never know. Are you going back up again now before, are you going back up again to give them a hand in the double oh. base? Oh, I will indeed. I'll go. I'll go up next week, someday, maybe Tuesday or Wednesday, wherever. Oh, right. I... You know, Colin. Well, of course, people. I I went out canvassing a few years ago. It's easier canvas when you're not known. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> when you're not going on to own local houses. Well, I tell you, it's easier canvas outside of um a pandemic as well. You know, it's much easier when you can go around in twos and during a normal election. All oh, right. Oh, jeez, I forgot about that, yeah. And knocking people's doors and leafleting. Yeah? Anyway, Connor, we wish you the best. Um, I, I don't know how long more you're going to be living at home. Hopefully it won't, hopefully it won't be for another long period of time. And Thanks for wish... having me on. Oh, absolutely. Anytime, Connor. If you want to come on and, 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 and get publicity for any event, just give us give me a ring or, or an email and we'd we'll be more happy to do so if you want to highlight any aspect around okay. the town here. But I want to wish you the best in the future, how something. I want to wish your party the very best in the election. And uh, you never know, the comeback might begin with Dublin Bay South. Thank but, you. But for this edition of Confidential Connor, Council Connor Sheehan, thank you very much, Connor, and the best of luck. And take care. Bye bye now.